Hello everyone, I am the Mad Head Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. A Flight is a series where I review the latest released or upcoming set for any and all cards that might have some form of impact in Commander. These episodes will be done under the assumption that you've already seen all of the cards in a set and isn't meant to be a spoiler video. This video is my own analysis on the cards I feel are most useful in the Commander format. A Flight is a sampling of several brews, so in this episode I will be sampling all cards from the completely spoiled Ikoria Layer of Behemoths. However, due to viewer input, this episode of A Flight will be broken in two parts. Part 1 will be my evaluation of the legendary creatures of the set, and part 2 will be my evaluation of the rest of the cards of the set. So if you want to see how useful the rest of the cards of the set are, follow the link above to part 2 of the episode. If you want to see the deck list for any of the deck texts I mentioned throughout the video, you can find links to them down in the description. If you like any of the cards I'll be mentioning, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find a link to it down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. Other ways you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. Patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube and higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server. You can find a link to that down in the description also. In fact, patrons got a chance to see both parts of this episode earlier. Alright, let's get back to the episode. The Korea Layer of Behemoths is a bottom-up design set inspired by Kaiju. The 84th Magic Expansion, it is a large set with 275 cards, so this will be quite the sampling. Since the focus is on cards useful for Commander, let's begin with the legendary creatures in the set. There are no mono-white legendary creatures in the set. I guess it's so hard to design decent mono-white legendary creatures that they just gave up altogether for Ikoria. In fact, there aren't any mono-blue or mono-black legendary creatures in the set. In fact, over 90% of the legends in the set are multicolored. The only two monocolored legends are Yudaro Wandering Monster and Kogla the Titan Ape. For Kogla, I already released a deck tech video for him if you want to check that out and get ideas on how to brew him. As for Yudaro, you won't be able to take advantage of its cycling ability from the command zone. That being said, it is an 8-8 with Trample and Haste for 7 mana. With enough rituals like Seething Song or Iron Crack Feet, you can cast it much earlier. In fact, with Iron Crack Feet alone, you could cast it. Once on the battlefield, it could do a ton of damage since it's a 3 turn clock. However, you can try and get Ronin War Club, Sigh of the Shinobi, Storm Rider Wig, and Hero's Blade onto the battlefield turns before you cast Yudaro, so that they automatically attach to him and make him even larger. You could even add Blood Mist in order to give Yudaro double strike when you're going to attack with it the turn it hits the battlefield, thus making it very possible to one-shot an opponent the moment it hits the battlefield, giving a whole new meaning to hit the ground running. As I mentioned earlier, over 90% of the commander hopefuls of the set are multicolored. In white blue we have Urion Sky Nomad. Since Urion can't be used as a companion in the commander format, let's see how it could be used as either the commander or one of the 99. Urion is clearly an excellent piece in a blinking deck with Brago King Eternal or Rune of the Hidden Realm at the helm. However, I think that Urion is good enough to fly solo. It has the potential to be a breath of fresh air, no pun intended, for the blinking archetype. When Urion enters the battlefield, the blink effect is delayed, meaning that things return at the beginning of your next end step. This could provide some insane and fun interactions where it's almost like phasing. If you delay blink a creature like Restoration Angel and then have the angel blink Urion when it returns to the battlefield at the end of the turn, this will have Urion blink everything until the beginning of the next end step, which would be your opponent's end step. So you could have a blank board state every other turn or at least for things you want to protect. So if it's your turn, you could cast wraths like Hour of Revelation, Planner Cleansing, etc. in order to not lose your things while destroying everyone else's. And if there's something you'd rather not blink, you don't have to. The interactions in a deck like this are so convoluted and interesting that Urion is definitely a commander I could get behind brewing. So stay tuned for an episode of Urion in this third season of the brewery. Blue Black has Geruda Doom of Deaths. This companion can be used in Commander. Fortunately, since the deck building restriction is that all cards in your deck have to have even converted mana costs, Phoenix God of Deception and Mirko Vosk Mind Drinker can't use Geruda as their companion, even though they're the best commanders for mill decks. That being said, Geruda can cheat in any creature with an even converted mana cost from any library. It goes great as the companion of Graveyard Matters decks like Gisa and Garolf, Muldroth the Gravetide, Otrimi the Ever Playful, Cedrus the Traitor King, CDC Brood Tyrant, Verena Lich Queen, and Rexiel the Risen Deep, just to name a few. Some of these commanders self mill themselves for value, so you have a fatty in the graveyard, you can cast Geruda from outside of the game in order to reanimate it. You can also run Leyline of Anticipation and Vidoc and Ori in these decks since they have an even converter mana cost. You would have to take its deck building restrictions into consideration for every card in your deck though. So although you won't be able to include Soul Ring or Mana Vault, you can still include the Moxin, Mana Crypt, and two costed rocks like Felbrar Stone, Arcane Signet, Thought Vessel, etc. As a commander, you don't have to follow Geruda's deck building restrictions. 
I feel like Gerudo is also good enough to be used as a commander of its own deck. You could include plenty of blink effects like Deadeye Navigator in order to blink it multiple times in a turn. Or with infinite mana you could sink it into Deadeye Navigator in order to blink Gerudo enough to deck the entire table or win with either Laboratory Maniac or Jace Wielder of Mysteries on the battlefield. Keep in mind also that you're reanimating a creature with an even converter mana cost each time, so you could cheat in Thassa's Oracle and win the game when you have a handful of cards remaining in your library. You can also reanimate any even costed creature from opponent's graveyards, or you can include It That Betrays, Sponsai of Ulamog, or Ulamog's Crusher in your deck in order to reanimate Eldrazi with Annihilator to really take over the board, or be especially evil and reanimate Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger to really bring the dread to the table. Other Eldrazi to include would be to prevent self-milling ourselves when it's not beneficial to do so, like Kozilek Butcher of Truth and Ulamog the Infinite Gyre, since these will just shuffle our graveyard back into our libraries. So Giruda is definitely a great commander for a mill deck on its own merit without having to be a companion. And if you want to be extra special, you could use its Gigan Cyberclaw Terror version if you really want to make Giruda stand out when putting it in the command zone. So if you want to try something other than Phoenix or Murkrovos, Giruda is definitely an amazing commander for mill decks. Black Red has Giruda's spiritual rival in Obosh the Prey Piercer. As a companion, Obosh pairs amazingly well with commanders that can deal a ton of damage by default, like Daragas Reincarnated, Karthus Tyrant of Jund, Thraximonda, or Anzurgo Helm Speaker. If Obosh is cast before these commanders, then when they hit an opponent, they turn they enter the battlefield, they're a two turn clock instead of a three turn clock. If you're able to give them double strike that same turn, they can one shot opponents. Obosh can also work with the Sliver Legion, Sliver Overlord, Sliver Queen, and the First Sliver in order to make them into two turn clocks. If you also have Slivers or Anthems that are pumping your creatures, then these Slivers become even more dangerous and can also potentially one shot opponents. Obosh can also be used as the companion of commanders that deal damage like Vile Smasher the Fierce, Nekostar the Mind Razor, Kirvek the Merciless, and Judith the Scourge Diva. Obosh can make these commanders deal way more damage than usual. I feel like Obosh would be better for commanders like Nekosar and Kerevek since these hurts opponents more often than the other two. Most wheels have an odd cost like Wheel of Fortune, Windfall, Reforge the Soul, etc. So Nekosar can still do its thing with Obosh's deck building restrictions. Kerevek pings opponents with every spell they cast. With Obosh out as well as other damage doubling effects or by even just giving Kerevek infect, you could prevent opponents from really casting anything. And if they do, they die. So it can definitely make for an easier Karavik deck to put a soft lock on the game. Obosh also pairs well with Greven Predator Captain as a way to not only pump him, but to make sure he deals double damage. So Obosh can make Greven potentially one-shot opponents pretty consistently. Hell, you could even make Obosh the companion to commanders like Barktooth Warbeard and Lady Orca in order to make them epic beaters. So if you detest playing with mainstream commanders, nothing beats playing with vanilla commanders that don't even pass the vanilla test. On its own, Obosh could be the commander of a pain deck with lots of damage doubling effects with plenty of group slug cards as well. You don't need to only include odd costed spells if Obosh is your commander, but if it is your commander, then the odd costed ones you use will double the pain to that opponent or player instead. If you don't want to die before opponents, you could play cards like Platinum Empyreon and or Platinum Angel to circumvent the pain that would be dealt to you. Keep in mind that Obosh doubles the damage itself deals too, so you could also one-shot opponents if Obosh is large enough. Red Green has two legends, Giantha the Wellspring and Godzilla King of the Monsters, which is actually Zalortha Strength Incarnate, but the non-Godzilla version of this card doesn't exist. I do have a deck tech video for Godzilla King of the Monsters, so if you want to see a way to build it, you can check it out in the link above. As for Gigantha, as a companion, it could be used in the usual specs like Joda Archmage Eternal, Sisei with the Light Captain, Golas Tireless Pilgrim, General Tazri, Horde of Notions, and Najila the Blade Blossom. However, keep in mind that if used as a companion, these decks have to comply with the deck restriction rules. If so, then just tapping Gigantha can provide the needed mana for their abilities. Gigantha can pay for any spell in a Jota deck if he's on the battlefield. Gigantha can pay for Sisei's, Golos, and Tazri's ability. With Najila, Gigantha makes it easier to activate Najila infinitely many times. If Gigantha has Vigilance, it can attack. Then you can tap Gigantha to pay for Najila's ability and then get another combat phase. You can then do this indefinitely to get infinitely many combat phases. Gigantha can also be used to great effect in Sliver decks since it taps for Wooburg, making it easier to cast your Sliver Commander since Gigantha is way easier to cast than any of the legendary Slivers. As a commander, Gigantha is pretty much an epic mana dork that can command a 5 colored deck. You can slot in Jota as one of the 99 and or Fists of Sons. That being said, I see Gigantha's potential more as a companion since you're still technically able to access it whenever you want since the start of the game, much like a commander. 
That being said, if you want indefinite access to Gigantha without the deck building restriction when used as a companion, then you just have to use it as a commander instead. Green White has Kahira the Orphan Guard. As a companion, Kahira wants your deck to be a tribal deck with any combination of either cats, elementals, nightmares, dinosaurs, or beasts since it has a lord effect giving these creatures plus one plus one and vigilance. However, each creature in your deck has to be one of those. The problem is, save for two mono white nightmares, the rest of the creatures of the nightmare type are outside of Kahira's color identity. That being said, it's easier to build decks with cats or elementals and have Kahira be the companion for Araba War of the World, Gishath Sun's Avatar, or Horde of Notions. Every creature in Arabo, Gishath, and Horde of Notions would have to follow the deck building restrictions, but there are plenty of creatures fitting those creature types that can be used in your decks. Similar to Gigantha, I wouldn't use Kahira as a commander since it's better suited as a companion to any of these three commanders. That being said, if you do use it as a commander of a wacky tribal deck with multiple tribes, you can since the deck building restrictions are only if you use it as a companion but not as a commander. White Black got two potential commanders. General Kudro of Dranith is a human tribal commander with an anthem effect for said creature type. Additionally, whenever he or another human enters the battlefield, you can exile a card from an opponent's graveyard. So this is excellent against Graveyard Matters decks as a bonus. He has a third ability where you pay two and sacrifice two humans to destroy target creature with power four or greater. Since you want to get a lot of humans with this commander, the best way to go about it would be tokens. Having a bunch of human tokens entering the battlefield would definitely hinder Graveyard Matters decks but you'll also have a bunch of fodder for his fatty destroying ability. There's plenty of human token creators, but the best, in my opinion, for this deck are called the Copper Coats, Increasing Devotion, and Reverend Hoplite due to the amount of humans they can create. However, you can still get human tokens consistently with cards like Castle, Arden Vale, Westvale Abbey, and Thrabin Doomsayer, which can create a human at instant speed, and Trin, Champion of Freedom, which can create a human at the end of your turn if you attack. You can also take advantage of Kudro's ability with cards like Zathard Necromancer. Not only is it a human, but whenever a human dies, it creates a 2-2 black zombie, replacing the human you're sacrificing. That way, your net loss in creatures is zero, so there's definitely a couple of ways to build around Kudro to say the least. That being said, I'd prefer using Jirina Kudro as a human tribal commander if I had to choose between her or her grandfather. Oh, one last thing. Keep in mind that with Conspiracy, you can choose human and have all of your creatures be human everywhere in the game, so that makes it even better for the Kudros since you can include other creatures but still give them the benefits. The other white black legend is Lurus of the Dream Den. Unfortunately, so far Lurus can be the companion of only two commanders, Ailey Eternal Pilgrim or Karlov of the Ghost Council. Lurus has its uses for both of them since it can reanimate something Ailey sacrificed later on. It also has lifelink and Ailey's last ability requires you to have 10 or more life than your starting total, so it definitely helps. Karlov also likes gaining life since he gets two plus one plus one counters on him whenever you gain life. That being said, I think Lurus is better suited as one in the 99 of decks that can take advantage of its reanimation ability. Lurus is able to bring back not just creatures but enchantments and artifacts as well, so you can use Lurus to recast things like Lotus Petal or Lion's Eye Diamond. In fact, you can use this and Blinking Lurus to generate infinite mana. Lurus has a ruling that says if you cast one permanent spell from your graveyard and then have a new Lurus come under your control in the same turn, you may cast another permanent spell from your graveyard that turn. With Lurus Soul Bonded to Deadeye Navigator, you can crack Lion's Eye Diamond to get 3 blue mana. Use 2 to blink Lurus with Deadeye Navigator. Then recast Lion's Eye Diamond and crack it for any other color since you already have the blue left over for Deadeye Navigator's cost. So with enough iterations, you can get infinite mana of every color if you wanted to. So there's definitely plenty of engines you could use Lurus for. You can use Lurus for even simpler things like recasting Mystic Remora each turn after not paying for its cumulative upkeep cost you'd then only be paying 1 blue mana each turn for it instead of its cumulative upkeep cost each upkeep. Blue Red has Riel the Everwise since Blue Tree was banned the moment it was spoiled. Riel has a built-in Rune Chanter's Pike effect stapled on. Additionally, whenever you discard one or more cards for the first time each turn, you draw that many cards. This makes Riel an insane addition to any deck of the Wheeling archetype as well as possibly being the commander of such a deck. When you cast Wheel of Fortune for the first time your turn, you're going to draw 14 cards and that's damn impressive. You can also include cards like Library of Lang if there's cards you don't want to discard to your graveyard and thus draw them afterwards. Since wheel decks tend to be spell slingy, this benefits Riel even more. In fact, she could be the commander of a control deck with tons of counter magic and removal spells. The more instants and sorceries in your graveyard, the harder she hits. So you could control the game and then make her unblockable in order to start eliminating opponents one at a time with commander damage once you have a solid lock on the board. 
Black Green got two legends. The first one is Shovel Bane of Monsters. Similarly to Matha's Fiend Seeker, Shovel seeks to take advantage of creatures dying with bounty counters on them. Now, unlike Mathis, Shovel does work with, as you'd expect, with Bounty Hunter. Since Shovel's abilities are in two different power graphs, unlike Mathis, that means that if Bounty Hunter was the one that put a bounty counter on a creature, Shovel will still trigger if that creature died. Other than that, Shovel's a pretty slow card. There are way better black green commanders to run if you want card advantage from creatures dying. That being said, if you want something cheap and different, you can brew around him. The second black green legend is Umori the Collector. Umori is a great companion if you want to always have access to spell cost reduction. However, in order to use it as your companion, every non-land card in your deck needs to share a card type. For the most part, it's going to have to be creatures. However, if you have this as the companion of Farika, God of Affliction, then you can have a deck full of enchantments and enchantment creatures. That being said, I think Umori would make a better companion for Reaper King. If every creature in your deck is an artifact creature, which is most likely the case since every Scarecrow apart from Straw Soldiers, Mistforms, and Changelings are artifact creatures, you would also be able to include artifacts in the deck. That means that apart from lands, your deck would only be able to run artifacts and artifact creatures. This isn't a problem since Reaper King has built-in Vindicates whenever a Scarecrow hits the battlefield. On its own though, with Umori as the commander, you don't need to build with its restrictions and thus can be used to reduce the cost of whatever card type you want once it enters the battlefield. In this way, Umori could also be used in one of the 99 in any kind of build heavier on one card type than others. Red White got two new legends and they are amazing. It's actually quite surprising given Red White's run with commanders, but since Feather the Redeemed, the design team has really stepped their game up. The first one is Winona Jonior of Forces. I recently uploaded a deck tech video on Winona so you can check out an analysis in greater detail for her there. Just know that she is crazy good. Also crazy good is the other one, Zirda the Dawn Waker. Zirda is easy enough to include as a companion of many decks since your permanents have to have some kind of activated ability. This is easy enough with pretty much every utility land except ones like Vesuva, Orborg Tomb of Yawgmoth, Glacial Chasm, Hall of Mist, and even the bands with other legends land cycle from legends. Since Zerda reduces the cost of non-mana abilities by 2 generic mana, so commanders like Kenrith the Return King, Golos Tireless Pilgrim, and others can take advantage of the cost reduction. Unfortunately, it doesn't reduce it to zero, but two mana is pretty significant. However, one main thing that Zerda does is allow Basalt Monolith and Grim Monolith to generate infinite colorless mana. That infinite mana can then very easily be sunk into Comet Storm and similar spells in order to deal infinite damage to all opponents. There are obviously limitless ways to take advantage of infinite mana, but this just shows that Zerda can also be the commander of a deck and still use its ability to full advantage. If that weren't enough, it can also be used to prevent a creature from blocking. It seems kind of random, but the fact remains that it has an activated ability too. Green Blue has two legends, Karuga the Macro Sage and Kinnon Bonder Prodigy. If you want to see a full deck tech to see how you can build around Kinnon, you can watch a video of it in the link above. Maybe you can get some ideas from it. As for Karuga, using it as a companion requires the non-land cards of your deck to have converted mana costs of 3 or greater. That means no 1 drop mana dorks, no 0 costed, 1 costed, or even 2 costed mana rocks, fast ramp spells, etc. So just like Karuga, the spells in your deck have to be beefy. As a bonus for this, when Karuga enters the battlefield, you draw a card for each other permanent you control with converted mana cost 3 or greater. So it does prize you for taking the slow route. I mean, you can still run mana rocks like Chromatic Lantern, Coalition Relic, etc. as well as running ramp spells like Cultivate and Kodama's Reach so you won't be so far behind. That being said, you can still also run Karuga as one of the 99 as well as the Commander in order to bypass its deck building restrictions. You'd still be able to take advantage of its ability too. In fact, blinking it often can really fill up your hand depending on what you have on the battlefield. The Wedge Color Legends are the apex cycle of creatures from the set. Since each of these have a trigger dependent on the mutate mechanic and Ikoria is the only set in the foreseeable future with this mechanic, it would be ideal to include as many creatures with mutate in each corresponding deck. That's why for the rest of the set review, I will omit discussing any creature with mutate unless it can work effectively on its own. Anyone omitted are just best included in their pertinent decks. Alright, so let's get started with Snapdax Apex of the Hunt. When Snapdax mutates, it deals 4 damage to a potential blocker, which is important since it has double strike, so it has the potential of being able to take out an opponent in one hit. It costs 5 to mutate, but if it mutates onto a creature without summoning sickness, it can attack that same turn. Since Snapdax only has 3 power, it's best to mutate it onto a stronger creature or a creature with enough power to be able to take out an opponent in one shot. You can mutate Snapdax onto creatures like Malignus or a Minion of the Waste. Malignus has enough power to take out anyone regardless of commander damage since it has half their life as power. 
but with Minion of the Waste, if you pay 11 life, it's an 11-11. Mutating Snap Docks on it will make it an 11-11 with Double Strike. All you need to do is get through, so you might want to give it unblockable with equipment like Whisper Silk Cloak or Rogue's Passage. So Snapdax is definitely an interesting commander to brew around since you could also make quite the pile of mutated creatures as well to take even more advantage of the new mechanic. Eluna Apex of Wishes makes for an interesting one of these because not only is it quite the beater as a 6-6 with flying and trample, but it can also cheat things when it mutates. However, once you have the choice, which I think is important, since you might want to keep a mutate creature in your hand, instead, if you'd rather mutate it, then have it enter the battlefield as a normal creature. What's great about the mutate mechanic is that the entire pile moves zones. So if you want to change your strategy from going tall to going wide, you can just blink a Luna and have all the creatures enter as a horde. However, since Eluna is better served mutating, much like the other Apexes, you can bounce it to your hand instead. Cards like Crystal Shard, Erratic Portal, and Portal of Sanctuary can be used to bounce a large mutate pile to your hand so you can use them to mutate again later on and take even more advantage of them again. You can also bounce Eluna with Sanctum of Eternity, and not just Eluna either, but the rest of the Apexes as well. Speaking of which, Nethroi Apex of Death is the next one on the list. Quite literally, actually, since Nethroi is going to be on the next episode of the brewery, so I won't go into too much on it now since you'll be able to see an even greater analysis for it in that video, so stay tuned. Vadrock Apex of Thunder is the runt of the litter but because it's the cheapest one to cast and mutate. Vadrock also wants to be in a cheap spell slinger deck since it can cast cheap non-creature spells for free whenever it mutates. Keep in mind though that it's not just limited to instants or sorceries either. You can also cheat in enchantments, artifacts, and planeswalkers, so Vadrock has near limitless uses. So you could balance a deck with mutate creatures and cheap non-creatures. You could build a heavy control build with Vadrock and then mutate it onto larger creatures in order to beat up opponents while limiting what they can do. If you include stasis in this deck, then whatever you have to sacrifice stasis, you can get it back for free whenever you mutate Vadrock. Similar to what I mentioned with Lurus, you can also use Vadrock to get back Mystic Remora if you decide to not pay its cumulative upkeep cost. The last legend of the set is Brokos Apex of Forever. Brokos doesn't have mutate triggers like the other Apexes do, so if you want to get on the mutate bandwagon in those colors, then Ultrami the Ever Playful would be better suited for that. That being said, since Brokos can be mutated from the graveyard, that means that it bypasses commander tax. That's nothing to scoff at in a grindy game. However, since Brokos doesn't really have an archetype to build around, it's not going to really be a target. So you can use Brokos for value like sacrificing it to cards like Greater Good. What I like most about Brokos is including it in Graveyard Matters deck in order to make its commander stronger. For example, I'm considering Brokos for my CDC Brood Tyrant deck. I can mutate Brokos from the command zone onto the CDC and have CDC be a 6-6 with Trample, making it much less risky to send her to the red zone to trigger her ability. There should definitely be a couple of ways to think outside of the box with Brokos. Alright, that does it for the first part of this episode of A Flight. If you want to see my evaluation of the rest of the cards of the set, just go to part 2 of this video. In the meantime, I want to take this opportunity to thank my patrons by giving a shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. And to everyone, thanks for watching this half episode of A Flight on the Commander Tavern. I am Dimitri Kirby, and see you in part 2.